Hello and for person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a somewhat fascinating topic of synthetic life, and more specifically, a concept known as Xenobot. In this case, the Xenobot version 3. And it looks like by studying this unusual form of life, or whatever this is, the scientists have discovered the completely new way for living organisms to reproduce and to basically spread their progeny something that has never been seen in any animal or plant life ever before. And so let's discuss this concept in a little bit more detail, talk a little bit more about Xenobot 3.0, but let's actually start with our unhealthy or maybe somewhat curious fascination with creating new life or just creation in general. I mean, when you think about it, all of the early science fiction was mostly based on the human's fascination with creating something else. We of course have the early 19th century Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Here's the early adaptation of the Frankenstein's monster created by the Edison Studios back in 1910. We even have some of the early drawings and early research from Leonardo da Vinci back in 1495 that essentially resembles some sort of a humanoid robot or a mechanical knight that was able to potentially move his hands, open his jaw and possibly even move around to some extent, but it's not really clear if this was ever produced or if it was just a mechanical drawing. What is clear though is that a lot of it was based on the Da Vinci's fascination with the Vitruvian man and his initial concepts at trying to define the perfection of human body and potentially even recreate it to some extent. With some of the more complex examples of this coming from Japan, this is the so-called Karakuri puppets. The puppets that essentially act like actual humans, but in reality are just these really complex mechanisms, with some of these puppets created for entertainment purposes, but some of them being made to even perform simple duties around the house, such as during the tea ceremony to serve tea. And so for centuries we've had this fascination with creating of something mechanical, something robotic, and something that potentially resembles us. I guess we usually refer to this as an android. But on the other hand, there's always been this other fascination of creating life in general, synthetic life. So basically not necessarily a robot or something that resembles us, but something that has similar functions to life, but something that might not really have a definitive use just yet. And so in the last few years, a lot of scientists have been working on a lot of different biological systems in order to create what we would refer to as a synthetic life. We've talked about some of these examples in some of the previous videos that should be popping up at some point, but I guess some of the best examples are Synthetic East, the website for which you can find in the description below, or the so-called Build a Cell Foundation that's essentially trying to recreate a simple cell using nothing but simple building blocks. This was actually one of the most fascinating studies that I've read in the last few years. But the most fascinating study to date, in my opinion, is the Xenobot study this right here. And this really takes it to a completely next level. This is basically a combination of some of the most advanced studies we have today in order to create synthetic life. Now the word Xenobot itself comes from the name of the frog, the African clawed frog known as Xenopus. A lot of this is made out of cells from this particular frog. Specifically, it combines a lot of biological tissues from the frog embryo with tissues then reused for other purposes. Here's sort of in a nutshell how all of this works. Each of these embryos, frog embryos, are used for harvesting of various tissues from the embryos before they develop. A lot of these tissues are going to be used for different types of construction and essentially are used as basic materials. The main purpose in this case is to isolate individual cells and to then use these cells to create something a little bit bigger and a little bit more complex, but something predetermined by the scientists. And the scientists currently refer to this as reconfigurable organisms. With all of this just using two blocks, the passive blocks and the contractile blocks. With the blocks themselves representing two different types of cells from within the frog embryo. The skin cells, whose main purpose is to provide rigid support, and the hard cells that are used for small locomotive purposes. For example, for contraction, for moving forward, or to essentially expand the volume. But what makes this concept a little bit more interesting than just poking around with different cells is how all of this is designed. 
All this is then designed by a really complex AI algorithm that provides the design for the most likely successful configuration that's going to work based on the cells provided. In other words, the shape itself, the functionality of this uh, organism, is designed by an artificial intelligence. And it's then assembled using various biological techniques using these cells from the frog embryo. And so basically the way that this works is you take a computer simulation, you design something on the computer, make sure that it works in that particular setting, and use each of the individual blocks to recreate this using actual cells. And because of this, currently, well, it's kind of hard to define exactly what's being created. It's not really life, and it's not really a robot. So it's something in between or something entirely different. And in this case, it's referred to as the programmable organism or a living programmable organism, or simply Xenobot, because that seems to be the best name for this right now. And because this is technically based on a very complex evolutionary algorithm that goes through a lot of different simulations to evolve this organism for certain functions, in some sense, it is kind of life, but just not the life we are used to. And so in the last few years, since the original report of Xenobot 1.0, a lot of new advances have been made in this particular study or in this field of study, and a lot of new things have been discovered, a lot of new functions developed, and more importantly, a lot of new models and designs have been created for very specific different purposes. For example, some of these have been designed to walk, to swim, to push things around, to carry things around, or to basically aggregate a lot of materials, collecting them into one large chunk. On top of this, by design, this organism seems to be able to regenerate itself and to essentially repair its cells even if it's damaged. But nevertheless, it does have a limit to its lifetime, usually a couple of weeks or so. So it's not an immortal organism, it's an organism designed to survive for just long enough to complete its function, but then it sort of disintegrates and becomes nothing but organic matter, simply because these are just simple biological cells from a typical frog. But interestingly enough, despite this being a frog cell with frog DNA on the inside, they don't actually act like frog cells anymore and seem to develop new functions and even produce new effects. More recently, the scientists have even found a way to provide a bit of a memory to these unusual cells by adding an RNA molecule into these cells and essentially giving them a kind of a molecular memory, which helps some of these cells remember certain types of light. But at the moment, these particular studies only have one main purpose, trying to figure out how morphology and building of various structures in our bodies or other bodies works in general. These are essentially study of morphogenesis, building of complex structures and complex bodies. And that's basically what happened with Xenobot 3.0, a completely new design and a completely new function that nobody actually expected. Once again, designed by an AI, with the AI given one single purpose, create something that can then reproduce itself. And for some reason, when creating different shapes, the AI seems to have chosen one shape that was most effective. This shape right here. The shape resembling the iconic character Pac-Man. Now, this is obviously completely by accident, but according to the algorithm used in the study, it's the most effective shape to try to recreate reproduction. And it's really important to understand that reproduction in this case does not mean sexual reproduction or, for example, cloning or copying itself. It just means propagating itself in any way possible. And that was the only purpose of this AI. Develop something that allows for this to happen. In other words, find a way, mathematical way, for something to create something else. And naturally, in biology, at least here on planet Earth, a lot of different types of reproduction has been developed over billions of years, and a lot of it is very familiar to us. We obviously have things like this, where cells just copy themselves. We also obviously have cells that normally require some other cells, which is what we refer to as sexual reproduction. But the algorithm behind Xenobot 3.0 that you can kind of see assembled here discovered something entirely different, a completely new way of reproduction. It's this. The cells assemble themselves from other cells, and they create a clone of themselves by basically pushing blocks around, by pushing cells around. In other words, the reproduction in this case is done by assembling the copy of itself from the things around them. Which in essence is a definition of self-replication. They definitely replicate themselves, but just not in a way that we are familiar with. 
In this particular case, each of these xenobots is swimming around collecting hundreds and hundreds of different cells and then assembling baby xenobots. And all of this is done inside of this unusual Pac-Man-like mouth shape that seems to act as a kind of a shovel-like shape, able to collect things together and able to push them into a certain direction. And after a few days, each of these unusual Pac-Man xenobots was able to create a somewhat similar xenobot that was able to perform similar functions. And once again, all this is simply made out of these frog cells, with frog DNA on the inside, but acting in a completely different fashion. Normally, all of these cells on the outside would actually be responsible for sitting outside of the tadpole, and mostly protecting the tadpoles from various types of pathogens, but also for distributing various types of mucus, and basically acting as a protection for the tadpole itself. But none of these cells, or even the frog's DNA, is able to perform the function performed by the xenobots. So this part right here is developed entirely by itself and essentially is developed by the AI behind the design. More importantly, as mentioned before, this is actually the first time this has ever been seen in any biological entity. We know that some of the molecules assemble this way, but it's never been seen with cells. But what's kind of difficult to explain is how after months of calculations, this particular artificial intelligence came up with a Pac-Man looking shape as the best representation that seems to work in this particular case. For example, why exactly does it have just one big mouth and why not have a bunch of different protrusions everywhere? But having tested this, the scientists are now convinced that the shape seems to work really well. It even creates grandchildren and grand-grandchildren, so this does seem to result in reproduction. And so at the moment, it looks like these xenobots have been able to do a lot of different tasks that are usually done by life itself. They move around, they replicate, but more importantly, they can now be used for potentially practical reasons. One of the biggest applications for this particular technology is helping us with microplastics. Now here I'm not talking about these large chunks of plastics like plastic bags or plastic bottles that in theory you can just pick up and throw away or recycle. I'm talking about microplastics, the stuff that all of this produces as a result. And this is the most dangerous part of current plastic problem. It produces a lot of microplastics that seem to have spread everywhere in the ecosystem. Check out that previous video to learn more, but in essence, there is really no good way for us to currently remove microplastics from the ecosystem. Most of them are just too tiny and are actually accumulating to the extreme amounts in a lot of different species. But by using these xenobots, which by the way are biodegradable and will not actually increase pollution at all, in theory it's possible to have them collect these microplastics and move them into larger and larger chunks, which can then be collected by something else. So that's actually one of the potential practical applications of this really incredible technology. But I'm sure we'll come up with a lot more applications as new versions of Xenobot come out in the future. At the moment, this definitely is one of the most incredible discoveries and one of the most attempts at recreating something synthetic, something lifelike, but something without an actually good definition just yet. It's a programmable, configurable organism, but I guess it's not really life or will ever be life mostly because they're designed with a very specific function in mind and designed by artificial intelligence of all things. But I guess for now that's sort of all I wanted to mention. Check out all of the relevant links in the description below and if you've enjoyed this video make sure to subscribe because we'll be talking about this in some of the future videos as well. Share this with someone who loves learning about biology and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.